That shit crazy. Oh, welcome to Daily Conversation. Hope you enjoyed the show. We are back again, man. You know that daily conversation. It doesn't necessarily happen on a daily basis, but these are the things that we're talking about each and every day. Um, today's guest, man, this is this is an honor for me, just as a Coney Island native, as somebody who's watched this guy's story from not the very, very beginning, but pretty much like day two. This is my day one, man. My Coney Island brother, Starberry, is here. Steph, what up? What up, man? It's good. Chilling, How you man, doing? Chilling, man. How's everything? Uh, how everything? You out in China, right? Yeah, I'm in China right now. How's everything out there? It's cool. It's all right. You know, it's still um, it's still a time period where everybody's a little on edge, but everybody's back to work and everybody okay. doing what they normally do. So it's all right. It's not that bad. Good, because the states, you know, we still super quarantined, super in the crib. I'm not sure. Um, how far ahead China was on us, but it feels like we're not going to get out of here for a while. I mean, I think based upon what I'm seeing and from what I'm hearing, it's a little challenging back at home because of everybody pretty much got their own idea. I think right. in China, it's a little bit different because of the governance and how they do things here. Um, I think back at home, you know, we still got people thinking that this isn't that serious right. just because they're seeing people dying and they're hearing people talk about all oh, the flu, this, this amount of people die from the flu. Whereas, you know, it's a different type of virus. It's not, it's not the same strain. So I think, you know, the understanding and the thinking is a little bit off on how severe this virus really is. So I think, um, you know, once everyone starts to understand I think it'll play a different a play a different role in their lives as far as what they're doing, how they social distance, how they go about quarantining and, and you know staying in the staying in the crib. But you know, I think also it comes down to um, how they handle it as far as with the government. So you know, those these are a lot of the challenges that um, we're facing because my family's home, so I'm a part of it as well. It's not just because I'm, I'm in China working, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not a part of it. Um, so I, when I look at it, I'm, I'm really concerned about the decisions that are made. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, you were talking about the governance in China, so I would definitely like to kind of start right there. And we'll take them back a little bit, but I don't want to, like, this ain't an ancient history lesson. Um, no. what, was your, what was your, I guess, process transition like going from the States to being a full-time resident out there in China? I mean, it was different. I mean, things are done completely different. I mean, it's basically, if you can follow rules, you know, you can fit in. You can, you can do what you need to do. You know, it's, it's a different system. It's not the same as home where, you know, you can raise your hand for everything and speak out and talk about what it is that you want to want to talk about. You know, you can, but there, there may be some penalties for doing so, such as, not being able to do the things that you would like to do. Um, I think for me, you know, I don't have any qualms with what people are doing in their country. This is their country. This is not my country where I'm from. I wasn't born here, so it's a little bit different. So you gotta respect and um, obey the orders just as if you were to go to America, you gotta do the same. Where you get privilege, privileges, but are they really privileges when you're back at home? Like, are you really, you know, speaking free speech and do you really have freedom of speech to, to, mm -hmm. to speak out? Will you have consequences because of that? So it goes both ways. I, I think, you know, being that, you know, speaking in, in retro to um, what's going on here, you know, when they told everybody that they needed to self-quarantine and stay in the house, everybody did that. It wasn't, you know, there weren't people walking around doing what they wanted to do doing because it felt like, you know, this is, you know, it's my life. I can do what I want. The self quarantine is more so to protect everyone. Because mm -hmm. if you get infected, you can infect a hundred people. If those hundred people get infected, a thousand people, then ten thousand, then a hundred thousand. You know what I'm saying? So um, there's a there's a systematic idea and flow in what it is that they're trying to do and trying to make sure that they get in front of the virus so that they can suppress it. Gotcha. 
So when you first moved out there, what were some of the first hurdles that you had to overcome in comparison to life here in the States and then moving out there? Um, at first, it was the food, um, not speaking the language. Um, those culture, culture barriers were the, the main components in my challenges and being here. Um, you know, getting used to understanding the way how other people thought about what they thought was good and what was not good for you. Um, but when you realize that you're flowing in a different system and you're flowing, you know, under another uh, under another system, you 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 basically you, you start to understand like, oh, this fits, this works for what it is that I want to do and what they think is good for me to do here. Gotcha. Um, and it takes some time because you know you're basically emptying out all of what you've learned and what you've done over the course of your living and life of being someplace else such as being home in America. So, you know, but once I started getting used to the food, like they brought a big fish one day and they sat a big fish with the head on it and everything with the chicken head on it. I was like, oh, but now it's normal because it's so good. The food is so good when you eat it now. It's like, you know, you're not even paying attention to that. But this, these are the things that are, are that are normal and what goes on here, um, you know, the language is definitely a, a barrier. Um, I haven't yet learned how to speak Chinese fluently. I can understand some stuff and say some stuff. I could survive if I had to survive with my phone and you know some of the stuff that I know. But these are some of the, the challenges and things that I faced when I first got here. But now, you know, it's, it's pretty easy now. Right, and you so like heralded out there, man. I mean, as every time I'm seeing some type of document or some type of article or anything coming out there speaking about you, it seems like you're beloved by the people. I mean, tons of people say you like the Michael Jordan of China, right? But you're not, you're the Stephon Marbury of right. China, but you have the utmost respect. Um, what was basketball culture like making the transition from the NBA to going to the CBA and then becoming a champion? I mean, you know, when I first got here, I didn't realize how challenging it was. Playing in the NBA is easier than playing here. It's a little bit more challenging playing here because the rules are different. Got it. Um, and, 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 and the NBA is one-on-one, -on -one, you know what I'm saying? It's, you know, you got to play defense. If they can't guard you, you can score. Right. You know what I'm saying? You know who, who's going to be checking you that night here. They can play boxing one, boxing two, triangle two. They can play zone. You know what I'm saying? They can, when they play zone, they can have three people in the paint, one person on you, one person on the elbow. You know what I'm saying? So it's a little bit different in how you, it's like playing in college and high school, mm -hmm. but you're playing pro basketball. You know what I'm saying? So when I make this reference and it being easier from, everybody will say that from college to NBA is way easier if you're nice. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It'd be nice when you can play because the, the floor opens up. It's way, it's way more space playing in the NBA. So when I first got here, all of these different challenges came about. I didn't know that they didn't play man to man. I didn't know that they could play the. I thought it's professional basketball. You know, I mean, I I know the the rules are different as far as you know the three seconds. The lane was wider. It was just completely different when I first got here. But once I adjusted, which is easy, you know, all hoopers adjust or they really not, you know, I don't really yeah, consider it. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, you know, I, I adjusted, I made the I made the switch and I figured it out. Um and you know, once I figured it out, it was it was easy to mix and blend. I mean the challenges were not being able to speak Chinese to my teammates but at the same time basketball is a universal language so it was it wasn't that hard to get guys to understand what it was that i was trying to do and how i was trying to do it and when i first came here they all had this mystique about you know that i didn't pass the basketball that i only thing that i did was shoot and then when they started to play with me they were like man you're completely different from what everybody was writing and saying about you in the nba and your 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 personality i was like you know, I, I said in America, it's a little bit different. When you go against the grain, people have a, a they have an opinion about you. When you, when you abide and listen and be a puppet, 
it's a little bit different. And I never allowed Geppetto to dangle me. So for me, it was a little bit different playing in the NBA and then coming here and them understanding my, my style, my flow, and what my ideas were in trying to win. So being able to get them to understand my thinking and my way of how I play basketball, once they, once they understood that, they were like, this is the proper way of how you're supposed to play. It's calculated. It's, you know, it's, it's no risk. You're, you put in the work so, you, so that you can be consistent when you get on the court. So, you, you know, you give yourself a chance to win. This is your style. I was like, that's the way you're supposed to play basketball. Yeah, for sure, for sure. For sure. Now, it, you know, one thing about you that I've always admired is your, your hustle and mentality on and off the court. Um, you know, a lot of people know you for what you do uh, on the court, but talk about some of your business endeavors and things that you have going on, you know, aside from the, the, the most recent documentary, but, you know, I noticed the basketball behind you, you know, you have a, a few other um, things that you're working on. Can you talk about some of those? I mean, this basketball, we, 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 made the, we made these basketballs to pretty much change the way how people saw the basketball through their phone. You know, we recognize that this ball becomes like a filter without you turning the filter on. The filter is when you press the on switch um, on your phone when you turn your light on. Mm -hmm. um, as you see so many people biting now off of what we've done and what we brought to the market, which we love because we, we're, in a, we're in a constant evolvement and in, in advancing um, with the basketball. Now this ball right here that we, that we got that will come out um, it will it will have a feature where you can play with it in the real game. So the basketball is one of my biggest things that I've been working on because I feel like basketball is never going anywhere. And the way how people see the ball now is completely different. And one day I hope to have this ball in professional games where people will be able to capture the content and see the ball through their phone. Everybody, this is all you see people doing with their phone when they go to the game anyway. So all they're doing is turning on their light. So we got ideas of creating these platforms for people to utilize the ball in its own way. Um, I think for me, you know, coming out with $15 shoes, clothes under $15, it was vital and important because of where I come from in Coney Island. You know, we weren't fortunate to have and we weren't fortunate to, to, to buy Jordans and LeBrons for $200, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're black kids coming from the same place. I just felt like that wasn't um, something that was going to be conducive for people to be able to operate on earth, knowing the lifestyle and the way how they're trying to live in poverty areas. So coming out with my brand and doing that, and standing and continuing to doing that was was vital for the people. Um, I feel like, um, you know, when I was in Stephen Barry's, I was, I mean, we sold more shoes than Jordan at one point. Mm -hmm. And I think when people started to hear that, you know, a lot of the big big monsters they <laughs> they weren't they weren't down with that. So it was a heavy attack on how we basically got infiltrated and. The store went out of business, my brand went sideways, and then I left to go to China. So, you know, it's always, as long as I'm alive, my brand is alive. So it's always in the continuance and trying to put forth. But, you know, I think doing all of the business stuff that I've been doing, my stuff take time. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's, it's kind of like the documentary. Nobody really saw that coming, and then it just basically snuck up on people and put them in a chokehold and made them cry. You know what I'm saying? So, so for me, you know, it's all strategic. It's a lot of planning that has to take place. People talk about it and they hear it, hear about it, but then when it happens, that's when they know. Absolutely. Steph, just watching, you know, you from very closely, you know, seeing you in the park, seeing you in Lincoln, seeing you go to the league, you know, the first NBA jersey that I ever bought, you know, was your Timberwolves jersey. Yeah, I mean, up until then, I had only bought college joints. That was the first NBA joint I bought. Um, but you doing so many things for the community, popping out, having the games, having affordable sneakers and apparel. What do you think things went sideways where you went from a champion of a people to almost like the villain? You know, like for, for a homegrown kid to play at the garden is like, we all would love that. 
but at some point it went left. Can you just talk about how that kind of transpired? Um, I think, you know, with, with the Knicks playing in New York, that's the biggest media market, you know, in America. You know, I used to think it was in the world, but until I got to Beijing, where it was like 1.4 billion people, you realize how small America is. Crazy. But you don't think that way and know that until you go up elsewhere. I think for me, what, what happened was when I was playing for New York, they were writing about me so much and they were writing so many negative articles about how I thought and what I was, what was going on. They never really spoke on what really was happening. I mean, they were talking about all of the things that sold newspapers. Right. So I was on the front page and the back page every day the whole year. They never was talking about basketball. And I think people would get tired of talking about the same thing all the time, but they couldn't talk about the Knicks winning because that wasn't something that was happening. So what else is there to talk about? I became the story and the topic of discussion in something that was negative. And I think for me, I stood my ground and I stood my test and I spoke my talk when I talked and spoke about what it was that was going on in real time, the truth. And I think, you know, for me, you know, I never really had, I, I had no problem with saying what I did wrong. And I would submit to what I did wrong right then and there when it wouldn't be nothing about me speaking about something that I did. If I did something, I did something. Right. So I think, you know, as time went on, you know, you create these imageries in people's minds about this human being and people start to feel like, oh, you know, well, this dude is this way. You know, they already got you depicted to be something that they don't even know. They never even did due diligence to find out about that person or what was going on, why he said what he said or why he did what he did. So, you know, it's it, 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 it could have went either way because if you win, you you get depicted in a different light and when you lose, somebody got to somebody gotta be the person that they talk about. Somebody got to eat that, right. Period. I mean, and it was all good and I didn't mind eating it, you know. At the end of the day, I'm from New York. I know what it is. I, I watched it my whole life. Growing up, I watched how they used to do Patrick Ewing. I watched how, mm. how it went down. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So for me, it was it was no big thing. I still love the Knicks. I still love New York. I'm from New York, so I know what it is. So it's not really no, no big thing. It only make you it make you thicker, tougher, and make you stronger. So you got three layers that attach to that. And it allowed me to be able to, you know, experience all of what I experienced and then go someplace else and utilize all of what I learned you know, back at home and use that as a foundation and a platform to go someplace where it's way bigger and do something way bigger. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Now, over your career, you've obviously been a part of a lot of media projects and different productions, um, but I want to get into a kid from Coney Island. You know, talk a little bit about why this was probably the most special project you've worked on and, and how it all came about. Um, first, you know, I started off with us signing a deal to do a light pick movie. Okay. Then, you know, it kind of evolved with Jason Samuels and Nina Bon Jovi. They pretty much was like, well, let's start off with doing a documentary first about your life. And then let's see if it can evolve into a light pick movie. And I was like, I was like, ah, you know, I didn't really sign up to do a documentary. I really signed up to do this light pick movie. So it kind of switched and it changed. It went from one direction to another direction, which is still, you know, eyeballs viewing, but it's just a different flow and a different feeling. So when I, you know, I trust, I, I trusted Nina Bon Jovi and, and Jason Samuels and Kobe and Chike. I trusted, of course, Farah Gritika, you know, with what they wanted to do in their idea. Um, the timing was right because I had finished playing basketball and, it was like we captured so much content before that. We had so much content um, that we shot that it kind of made sense for it to go in this direction. Um, it became a, a huge project and us being able to speak and talk about how we wanted to get this, this project off the ground for people to be able to understand and capture you know, our side of the story. Because um, it's their side, our side, and then there's the truth. And I think when people watch the documentary and they see it, they understand a lot more 
about me as a human being first. You know, basketball is, it's just a little part of the documentary basketball. It's, it's the story, the storytelling and, and what went on and what happened throughout my career and throughout my life. And the best part about it is my family, they're honest. They're not gonna lie to nobody. They're not gonna lie for me. They're not gonna lie to no, they're not gonna lie to nobody. The truth defends itself. My people are all spiritually sounded people and you know, they have a deep understanding for other human beings and for them to have understanding about what is, is. So when we did this documentary and when I first seen it for the first time, I was blown away. I, didn't, I never even watched it. I watched it when they showed it at the Tribeca oh, Film Festival. Wow. Yeah, so people was like, you never seen it before? I was like, no, I'm watching it for the first time, just like you. That's how much confidence I had, you know, with, with Nina Bon Jovi. I mean, I didn't even sign, like I didn't even look at the paperwork to sign my life paperwork. I didn't even look at it. I just signed it because I trusted her so much for her to make me look the way how she wanted to make me look. My my documentary, I didn't even I didn't even sign up the one for that. I just was like, all right, get ahead, do it. You know what I'm saying? Because I had the confidence in her to be able to display this this message and this image of what she knew from what she went and researched and looked at all of the different things and then after her seeing what went on in China, she was like, Hold up, this doesn't make any sense. It's kind of hard to go someplace like China where the people are the way how they are. And then, you know, you do all of what you did in China, but here in America, it was so sensationalized that you couldn't really see it and, you know, see it or hear it when you watched it or you heard it. You had to literally go dig and go check, you know. So once you go down to the root and you go check from the origin, ground zero, that's when you really can know what's actually happening and what's going on. So the documentary is truthful, it's honest, it's inspirational, it's redemption. I left myself completely vulnerable for people to understand and for them to know the real, you know what I'm saying? So I think when people can see that, I think that's what gives people this feeling when they watch it and they say, wow, this is, this is a dope doc, this is cool, this is real, this is authentic. You know, you get all of these different words that people speak and talk about. Definitely. I think what really turned me on to it more afterwards was, you know, when you when you first sign on to watch something, you know, you click on it, you buy it, you watch it, you, you're thinking, okay, this is a basketball documentary, like you said, but right. it was really deep. There was a lot of levels there. There was a lot of people. I was kind of blown away too with the amount of, you know, it's not just for basketball lovers. You know what I mean? It's not for people who follow yeah. the sport. You know, you had a lot of guests on it, you know, Fat Joe, uh, Clark Kent, uh, Cameron was in, you know, a lot of different people. Um, who now knowing that you didn't watch it while it was happening, who was somebody that really surprised you that was in it and you were like, oh, that's that's kind of dope. I mean, none of them really surprised me because I know those guys. They know my story, you know what I'm saying? They watched it and they all like, you know, they had their opinions and their feelings about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like Chauncey, he, you know, he felt a certain way about when I left, you know, Minnesota. But at the end of the day, I really didn't care about basketball the way that these guys cared about basketball. Like, I love basketball, but you know, my, my life was, was way more important than playing basketball with Kevin Garnett in Minnesota. <laughs> I mean, I look at Kevin Garnett cursing out the, the owner of Minnesota because he didn't give him what he wanted. Now I'm looking at him like straight disrespecting this man, like, you know, to call him a snake motherfucker, excuse my language, but you know, when I see that and I hear that and I'm like, okay, so, you know, here we are 22, 23 years later, you know, it's a whole different feel and a whole different flow. When I was the person that went to them, they said I forced the trade. I'm like, you can't force nothing with nobody. They don't want to trade you, they, they don't trade you. They want to trade you, they trade you. Why? Because I said that I didn't want to stay there and I went and I kept it 100 with the owner and told the owner, you know, look, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to go to another team when I'm becoming a free agent. So I think you guys should trade me. If you don't, I'll just become a free agent. You won't get nothing. I mean, I thought that was more, well, I thought that was more plausible for me coming to them and, and speaking to them and talking to them in this light, opposed to them just saying, yeah, I'm a son and I'm gonna stay here and then I don't. That's snake, that's a snake move. And I wasn't on that. At a young age, I was still conscious and aware. You know, so for me, when I think about what guys think, like Stephen A. Smith talking about, oh, it's too cold. I'm like, dude, I live, you, you don't want to live someplace where it's 40 below. It's snow all the time. I'm like, it's 6% it's black people there. I went from New York 
to Atlanta, Atlanta to, Min to Minnesota. I'm like, you got to think, coaching me 19 years old, this is what I was thinking and what I was experiencing. But it seemed like nobody really cared about what I was thinking or feeling because they only could see what Kevin and I were doing on the basketball court. I'm like, yeah, I, I could do the same thing someplace else and who? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't have the same vision that you got as far as sacrificing your life for playing basketball. I was like, it's only going to be one champion at the end of the year. Right. <laughs> That's what it is. Right. I said, and I'm, I don't, I mean, for me, you know, committing myself to do something for that long period of time, it wasn't worth it to me. I and think I'm, now, if you look at basketball and the way that business is handled, um, you were almost like at the forefront of doing that, you know, really having your own destiny in your hands, deciding where you wanted to go, you know, understanding the business of basketball. So now when you see guys grouping up and forming super teams and you exactly. know, forcing where they want to go, it's like now it's, it's not so frowned upon right, yeah. as it was then. Let me ask you, did you feel any sense of vindication Going, you know, you went from tons of cameras on you from a very young age, city champ, you go to the league, you have your ups and downs in the league, and then you go to champ China and you win multiple championships. Um, was that like a sense of vindication? Was that like a sense of a sigh of release or anything like that? I mean, for me, when when I when I won the first championship, um the only thing that I ever tried to do when I was in the NBA, how I trained, was to try to win a championship. I had to use that as my barometer for me to train the way how I needed to train, to keep me locked in, to keep me focused. So when I got on the court every year, nobody can never say that I didn't bring it. I brought it every single night. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, as a hooper, when you bring it every night, it doesn't matter what people say or what they think or what's going on. You just get on the court and you do it. Professional sports, that's the hardest level to be consistent at and to dominate and to do your thing, no right. matter what people think or what they say. So when I went, when I came, um, when I came to, to Beijing and we won the first championship, because I didn't win the first two years. The first year I got here, we didn't make it to the playoffs. I mean, the team I came on, I came like halfway in the season. The second year I came, I played for a team that moved from one province to another province. Basically, like they moved from New Jersey to Brooklyn. Like so, but they had a whole new functionality and how they were able to get players. So they couldn't really get, you know, really good players. But I, I established myself. I had got I I, I finally got in one season under my belt. So when I went to Beijing, now I'm right. I'm ready. I'm back in my zone. I'm back in my space. And I come super ready. I trained the whole summer. And my, my mission was to come and win a championship. And when I first landed in Beijing, they was like, why did you come to Beijing? I said, I came here to win a championship. I said, I, I, said, I, I, I came here for it. And they were looking at me like, oh, yeah, all of the foreigners say the same thing. They come here to win a championship. They want to win a championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my my coach my 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 coach, he was like a, he's militant. My coach, I mean like super militant. We practiced three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon for fifty six wow. days. I was like, yo, this is nuts at first, wow. right? To myself, and I'm talking to the other foreign. I was like, yo, we're gonna have a break. He's like, nah, we're not gonna get no break. I was like, he gotta give us a break. This is crazy. And he was like, nah, this is what it is. So. Once I conformed and I got used to practicing that long and I started, my game started to get sharper. Everything started to feel different than when I played in the NBA. Now, this is the time when I was playing the best basketball of my life. So when I got into this space and I saw we started out 13 and 0, they never won this many games. Most games that they ever won is eight games in a row. We won, we won 13 in a row. Out of th in a 32 game season. So, you know, you win 13 games in a row. That's like in the NBA, it's like you looking like how the Warriors and the Bulls is looking, right? They think, oh, they're going to win the championship. Then one of our guys got hurt. One of, one of our main guys got hurt. We lost, we lost seven out of eight. So, that whole thought of everybody thinking that way, it went away. Then we came, he came back. Then we bounced back. We got back going to the playoffs. Then we start rolling. Now we knock off the juggernaut team. And I use all of what people were saying about I was a loser, I, didn't, I was selfish, I was all of these different things. I use all of that energy to go into every game that I played in 
to play at the highest level that I could possibly play it. And you can see it when you watch the film and you go back, when you watch the game, you can tell that I was playing for something. And all of what people wrote about me, what they talked about me and said, I, I just took all of that energy. I just put it all into my game. I put it into my mind to push me through so many different barriers. I broke my toe playing in the game and I didn't even feel it until after the game. Like it was that type of feeling and that type of mentality of what was going on. Not to prove anyone wrong because I already knew who I was. It was just to basically kill all of that noise, to silence. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're playing in a game and there's 19,000 people screaming, and you hit a three from nowhere and, and the whole crowd goes, like you silenced the whole crowd. That's how I felt like what I did to everybody in America. Like, just, just, just be quiet, just stay, just stay silent, don't talk, game over with. I ain't got nothing else to say, you ain't got nothing to say. And after that, you know, it was all good. You know, I moved into another realm. You know, they tried to get me to come back to America to play for the Rockets. Kevin McHale, the same dude that was saying that I was selfish and all of this after I left when I was in Minnesota. He was the dude that reached out like, yo, we want you to come out. I'm like, nah, I'm good. They're about to put a statue up for me. I'm not going to know this statue. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm good. Yeah, that's how you hit him. Now, I'm always fascinated. I think I know the answer to the question, but I'm going to ask anyways. I'm always fascinated when I talk to people, you know, of your stature. Do you... Is there any regrets or anything that you would have changed different in your life or you kind of, you know, good with where you're at and, and the life choices that were made? I'm a black kid from Coney Island. I knew it. I got two statues. I got two <laughs> statues. I got a I got a museum on a main road five kilometers away from Tenement Square. I got a green card. I got the key to Beijing. All of that was part of God's plan. I had to go through all of what I went through to get to where I'm at right now and talking to you guys in this moment to be able to speak and talk about the things that I've accomplished in my life. I already know this only by the grace of God. So me knowing that I'm deeply humbled by me experiencing all of what I experienced. I thank all of the people for saying what they said. That don't mean I'm not going to talk about it, but at the same time, I'm thankful for, you know, all of the hardship, all of the the, the trying times that I've experienced during that during the duration of that time period because it was it's, it's a testament that you know when you trust God and you keep God first and you keep him by your side in front of you behind you up above you and below you you already know you know you're covered by the spirit you're covered by the blood and I think for me when I know my spirit got me covered in my in my daily life and my flesh I'm 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 completely um, thank you for, for it all, because I know without those trying times, my mind wouldn't be able to operate the way how it operates right now. I wouldn't be able to think the way I think, speak the way I speak, and talk about the things I'm able to talk about if I didn't have these trying times. So regret, you know, it's like cancer. It really doesn't do anything for me. Steph, did you ever have any thoughts of coming back to the States to do anything basketball-wise? I know you're a coach now in China, um, but there's so many different opportunities now from, you know, TV analyst to coach to the big three. It's a lot of things that you can do post NBA career back in the States. Do you ever have any thoughts of doing any of that? Um, when I go home, I'm really not, I mean, this is my home to be honest. Like this is where I live at. Uh, you know, I, home is, of course, America is always home. That's where I'm from, but you know, I've been building what I've been building here, you know, during the time period when I needed um, to do the things that I wanted to do in America, there were no opportunities for me. You know, I pretty much, you know, it was like, we good, you know, we're all right here. You know, but when things started to establish in China, um, that's when things started to seem to open up for me to do stuff in America. I mean, you start seeing, you know, I would start. I started doing things on a way bigger platform, not even realizing the platform that I was on right. and the magnitude of um, the amounts of people that were, you know, becoming aware of what was going on in China. That I, I pretty much just continued to flow here. I do when I do go home. I try to do things and try to have certain things that I can offer. You know, and given my 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 understanding about what I've experienced, but 
you know, I'm not never going to say uh, I'm not open to things going on in America. Like I was, you know, asked about coaching in, in, in America and the NBA. And I was like, if it's right and it's the timing is right and nothing is going on here in China, which I doubt, right. you know, <laughs> um, but you never know. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to doing it under my circumstances and doing it the way I want to do it. It got to be structured, knowing how America is. I got to make sure it's all done the proper way and calculated. Where you know I'm, I have minimum risk. You know I know how to set up what I need to set up when I set it up based upon the legalities of what goes on in America. So you have to make sure that you're covered and protected in so many different ways. So you know, you got to literally think this way when you're doing business at home. So, because the rules is different and there's so many loopholes to get you that you got to make sure it's all solid and, and, yeah. and clean and clear. Got to be smart about it, for sure. Cool, man. So, uh, I guess, like, one of my last questions would be, you know, what does the future hold for you out there? You know, obviously, you're coaching now. That's, that's a big part of what you're doing now. But what are the next steps? What is, you know, you're still young, you know, what's the what's the move? I mean, I'm constantly evolving. I mean, right now, my focus is on coaching. That's mm -hmm. what I'm doing right now. Um, one step at a time, you know, doing that has been a very big challenge for me, coaching, because, you know, I, the, the, the team that I coach for is one of the biggest companies in the world, um, Beikun. Um, they got, I mean, they supply all of the water in Beijing. Mm. Um, you know, it's like the number one stock in, in China. So being that I work for a company, you know, such as this company, and then being a state-owned company, you, you know, there, there's so much that can possibly happen. Like they're talking about building a new arena. Like all of these things that are exciting in basketball that will continue to transform the, the game of basketball here and being a part of the evolution of basketball here, being that it's so young. It's only been in existence for like 22 years, wow. the, the league. Whereas you look at the NBA, it's probably on its mark of 75 to 80 years. So, you know, the gap is so, so far apart. But when you look at how the speed of China and, and the speed of basketball, how fast it's growing globally, you, you you really have to really sit back and think, you know, what impact you want to have in the game. And, you know, all of what China has done for me and helped me revitalize my life, not only basketball and basketball, um, you know, I'm completely thankful. And I think, you know, for me being able to have these opportunities where um, basketball has um, taken me from America all the way to China, 7,000 miles away, you know, basketball becomes the main component of what it is that I'm doing. Um, my off the court stuff, you know, I talk about that stuff when it happens. It's, it's, it's a variety of different things going on that I'm speaking and talking about it, you know, taking taking second and third steps. Um, but when it's, when it's all, all ready and produced and ready, I definitely reach out to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Steph, I'm gonna let you go. I wanted to ask you two more questions. Um, yeah, go ahead. You know, I'm, I'm a music guy, man. So musically, what you listening to? Are you listening to any of the music that comes from over there? Are you still listening to what we doing here in the states, or is it a combination? I mean, to be honest, I hear it when I hear it, but I don't even be on it like that. Like I be so busy working that I, you know. But I hear like I hear you know songs from with my. You know, my son playing something, <laughs> I jump on it. But if I if I need to go to, if I, I want to hear something, I just normally would go to the classes. I just listen to Big or gotcha. I listen to Pop or somebody like because you, you, know, you ain't missing nothing. Uh, <laughs> so you, you ain't missing too much these days. Um, I, I, I mean, the stuff that I'm hearing, I'm like, what did he say? I'm like, I don't even understand what he's talking about. Like, I don't, I have no clue. Steph, what's the better draft class? The 96 draft? 96, or, man. Or Come on, draft. son. 96. Stop. Don't even do that. Don't even do that. I don't know. And, you know, I love to have that little debate because I'm like, I, when I break it down, I'm like, just look at the people. People forget about Stoyakovic. They forget about, forget about El Goskis. They forget about it. Samaki Walker, Lorenzo Wright. I'm not Fact. even breaking. These dudes is the dudes that was doing their thing 
without even people knowing us that they was doing their thing. I'm like, and you don't even want to go to the other, the top guys. They want to talk about you and can be an AI and Ray. Not even going into that. Kobe. Not even going into that. There's a guy named Kobe in there too. Uh, right. <laughs> AI, Ray Allen, Steve Nash. You know, it's just a lot. It's, it's yeah. a lot. I remember, I remember that slam fold out, man. That was such a fire picture, man. Classic. 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 All right. Last question. Just because I'm a diehard Knicks fan and I'm dying hard. What can the Knicks do? What do they need to do? Is there any salvation for the organization? Come on, Steph. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a on, Nick Steph. Too. I'm a Nick I'm a Nick fan too, right? Since little kid. Even like dude was like, yo, you still a Nick fan after all of what happened with you? The I'm not a like, Van Tony dude. fan. I hate Van Tony. <laughs> I'm I mean, you know, that's that's another that's another show. But <laughs> you know, people who listen to you, they'd be like, yo, you know, all of what happened, you still talk about the Knicks. They be like, yo, you still rocking the Knicks, son. <laughs> like you still keep up, you keep up locked alone. I'm like, yo, you gotta understand something. When you from New York. And you're a Nick fan, and you think about trying to go to another team. You, you can never go. No, you can't go on the block no more. Yo, it's over for right? you. It's over. It's a. It's a wrap. Like you be like, oh, y'all trash. You could be. You could be trash forever, but you can't talk about the Knicks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, is there is there any fixing? Is there any is there any personnel? Is it an upper management thing? Like, is there anything? It's a whole show, son. It's a whole. It's a whole show. You gotta catch me on another round, son. <laughs> the whole show. It's, it's a lot. Part two. That's what it is. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, what people need to realize this. All right, and I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it a one. I'm gonna, as always. The Knicks is the number one organization in making money in right. basketball. Until that change, <laughs> if they drop to like five or ten or someplace like that, I think we might see a change. But if the way. cash is, it's a cash cow. So when that stop, that's when I think everything is going to change and it's going to pop. I was literally saying the same thing. I went to um, Nick's Paces, right? Like one of the last games before everything got shut down. And it was rammed. I'm like, yo, I mean, I got my tickets for free, right? I'm like, why are all of these, <laughs> yo, why are y'all paying it's money every <laughs> night to watch this losing team? And that's what right. I said, if they start losing people, they'll make changes. As long as his ass is in the seat every night. They're not, change. bro. They, they're not. You got to understand, people come to see the other team, too. <laughs> so it ain't just going to see the Knicks. They're going to shit and you. Sometimes they cheer more for the other people than the, than the home team. Right. You know what I'm saying? New York fans, they, you know, they, we're fickle fans. I'm going to keep it 100. We're, we're fickle fans. We, we're hot and cold. If you hot, we rocking with you. We're not talking about you. Talk about it. That's just what it is. That's, we could do that, though. Yeah. We could talk about it. Nobody else can. But you can't talk about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, how you can talk about it, but I can't talk about it. You know what I'm saying? So. When this go on and it's like that, you know, people always got to say, oh, you know, you know, you always talking about the Knicks. We, we need this. We need that. As soon as I say something, you want to jump down my throat. I'm like, well, this is what it is. But, you know, until I change, as far as, I don't know, man. I, it's, 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 it's hard, man. You know, Mr. D going to do what he doing. Mr. D like, man, listen, man, let's that shit some crack. Yeah, the the, 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 the baby still looking right. Hey, Steph, thank you so much, man, for your time. Um, I know no. it's a big time difference and all that, man, but I've been wanting to get with you so for I'm glad we was able to do it. Love to the whole family. How's your oh, son? Man. I know he the, he the, he the next good. coming. He's good. We got work to do. OK, we're going to work. We work. We're going to work with it. Now, Marbury name is a legacy, man. Appreciate <laughs> you for rocking with us. You be safe out Love. there. See you soon, brother. Love. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. That shit crazy. Oh, welcome to Daily Conversation. Hope you enjoyed the show. 